I've seen a lot of questions coming up on this front-end mentor project on my Discord community lately, and so I thought, why not build it myself? Hello there, my front end friends. Thank you so much for coming to join me for yet another video. And if you're new here, my name is Kevin and here at my channel, I hope you fall madly deeply in love with the wonderful world that is CSS. And today we're going to be doing that and more by building out the front end mentor project with this card that we have to make responsive. And we're really going to be doing it from the very beginning of downloading the assets all the way to getting it online. So let's jump right in and get started with it. So here I am, I'm going to go and visit the challenge and I'm going to download the starter and we're going to start, we're going to work completely from what we get uh, in here. We're not going to do anything fancy. We're going to keep things super simple for this one. So off screen, I'm just going to extract those files right there and we're going to jump right into it. And here is the what I got when I extracted it. And I did say we're gonna keep things super, super simple, uh, but I am going to assume that you already have something like VS Code installed, um, but you can just open this in your editor of choice. Uh, I am going to, I'm in Windows 11, so I have to right click, show more options, and then I have open with code right here. Uh, of course, there's other ways of opening it. You can do a file open folder and all the other stuff, but make sure you get it opened. And let's just quickly look at what we have. So we have this index, which they give us, which has their attribution thing at the top, their title a little bit there. We don't have to worry about the base structure. Uh, then we have here just the text that should be in our card and then the attribution stuff down here. That's the style for it. Uh, we can delete those if you want. It says feel free to remove them. Uh, they give us a style guide, which is good. Now, one thing I don't like about Front End Mentor is the names that they give uh, all of these things, but we do have the, you know, we, we do get these names. We'll probably come up with our own. Um, and yeah, we get the fonts that are being used and all of that, so we'll have to get those. Um, the README template here is if you want to change this, if you're going to upload it to GitHub, which we are going to do, how you can sort of you know, you can use this template as the, the readme for your own uh, one because you don't necessarily need to use this readme that is right here, uh, which goes over sort of how you can go through the challenge and the different things that you can do with it. So I'm actually going to delete this readme here. Um, I'm not going to update this one, but just if you want to, you can sort of go through and it gives details on the challenge and everything. So um, all of that is here. So I'll leave it like this, but if you want to update that readme, by all means, you can go ahead and do that. Um, there is a git ignore. If you're not used to GitHub or you don't have a GitHub account, don't worry too much about it, but it's just to ignore any files that we don't want actually getting uploaded uh, to GitHub uh, at the end of the day. So we can probably leave this alone and not worry about it too much. We have the images that we're going to be using that are here. And of course, we have the designs that are right here. And what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to right click and you should be able to do open in file explorer. So I'm going to do that and then I can just double click and just a fast way to get to them so we can see the design and you know that we're going to be building so we can reference that when we need to be able to reference it. Um, and because I can sort of it's off screen for you, but I can go between the different shots they've given me. Uh, so we can build that and I'll move this off screen for now, but we'll bring that back in as we might need it. Um, and especially because it's very uh, CSS type document that we're going to be working on, it's going to be a good thing uh, to be able to keep our design uh, close at hand so we can look at what we're actually trying to build. Now, if you wanted to, you could initialize a GitHub repo now. Uh, I'm only going to do all the GitHub stuff at the end just so we can upload it to GitHub and then easily get it online. We'll be using Netlify to do that. Uh, but if you want to sort of follow the steps and do commits along the way, of course, you could do it that way as well, which would probably be good for was a larger scale project. But for something small like this, uh, I'm not too concerned about it. Now, what do we need to do? <laughs> we need to come in. I'm going to save that file and we need a CSS file for this. So I am going to make a new file. I'm just going to call it style.css. And what I'm now going to go back to my index page and uh, because I'm in VS Code, it does come with Emmet. So I can just write link and then do a colon CSS and hit return and it auto fills it for me. If you're using something other than VS Code, you can get Emmet as an extension and then have that. Um, the style here isn't based on the file name I gave it here. This is the default and I just named it style.css knowing that this will go there. Uh, so if you made like a CSS folder, you might want to do like CSS to style dot or whatever you want, but for something very simple like this, 
um, I think it's fine just throwing the style in your root folder and not worrying too much about it. That's all we really need for this one is our styles and our index here. Now, one thing I'd recommend is having the browser opened at the same time as you're working. Often these days, I'd be using something like Vite to be able to do it because it's auto refreshing and it's really fast, it's really easy. But for this one, I'm gonna be using an extension called Live Server because uh, we're just keeping things really simple. If you want to use a different way of doing it, that's fine. If you want to use Live Server, you can find the link to it in the uh, description down below. The nice thing with the Live Server is here we can see where it says Preview. Um, let's just move this over a little bit. There we go. And let's say I put this inside an H1. I bring it over and I hit Save then it updates immediately here. I don't have to refresh my browser or anything like that. And I always get questions about how I do this in my videos. So one simple way when you're early on is something like Live Server, though if you're used to things like Vite or other um, build tools, you might wanna use one of those instead, um, but it's up to you on how you wanna work. So for this one, for now, I'm gonna keep the design on screen and I'm a big proponent of most of the time um, doing mobile first. But when it comes to writing the HTML, I always want to look at the desktop version of it because here everything is just stacked on top of each other. I don't really need to worry about the structure of anything. But when I'm, you know, eventually we do need to get this layout going on. So there is a bit more structure that has to come into things. So in those cases, or that's why in general, when I'm writing my HTML, I look at the desktop layout. But then when I start my CSS, I'll start with the mobile version. Now, we don't really have much going on um, for like actual structure. Normally, every page should have a main. So I'm going to put one just for good practice here. Um, but we don't really have like a context to put this inside of. Um, so what I am going to use, though, is an article for this. So we can say article, and I'm going to call it my product. Um, it could just be a, a generic card or something else. But again, because we don't have a lot of context, about what other parts of the site might look like. I think that we're okay just using um, a class of product. I'm gonna try and keep the class naming relatively simple for this one. Uh, I am going to use an article tag though, or an article element, and I'm doing that because an article is, can be used whenever something could be sort of a standalone piece of content. So can this piece be taken out of this website or this page that it's gonna be on and placed somewhere else and still make sense? And I think, yes, if I took this and I took it you know, if it was on a shopping page and I took it out and put it on a blog in the middle as an ad or something, or you're trying to like in a side or I can move it around and all the relevant information is contained within this one element. And it's not relying on information coming from anywhere else. I see it's a perfume. I see the name of the perfume, the description, the price, add to cart. Everything I need to know about this is here. It's not relying on outside information for me to understand what it is. So in that case, an article does make sense. Now we need two things. We're gonna to need to have two columns here. Um, there's different ways of doing it. We can get kind of creative, but we're gonna keep things pretty simple. So to keep things pretty simple, I'm gonna do here, we'll start with an image, but we're actually gonna update this and put a picture tag eventually. But for now, we'll, we'll just stick an image here. Uh, and then here we're going to come in and, uh, or actually let's, let's put the picture right away because we're gonna use a class on there, but we're, just, we're gonna set it up like this for the moment. Um, and we'll come back and sort of fix, do a little bit more with this and actually make it worth using the picture tag. And I'll explain why once we get to that stage um, or a little bit later on. Uh, but on here we can do a class is equal to my product image, uh, just like that. So I am using the BEM naming convention here of the double underscore to say that like this image is part of this product. Um, so just a common way of naming things. And then uh, I'm gonna come down here and I'm gonna do my product product content. Um, it could be body or something else, but the content. So we have my image and then we have the content itself. I am using BEM here. So that's why I'm doing dot uh, product content. And then I just push tab and it makes the div for me with the class on there. Uh, and then all of this is going to be inside of here. There we go. Uh, there's an important thing we need to think about at this point. Um, and normally I wouldn't use an H1, but I have no other content on here. So I will use an H1 for it. But we need to think about what the title of this is. Um, and actually I see it says preview here, but perfume over there. So we're gonna change this to say perfume. Um, but is the title perfume or is the title Gabriel Essence Eau de Perfume? Which one is the title? And to me, this is the title. This is sort of the category it falls under. If we had like perfume and then I had six different perfumes that were all listed, 
my perfume here would be the main title and then each one of these would sort of be a subtitle underneath that but because we're looking at this as like a standalone card that's or article right so it's saying it doesn't matter anything else that's going on anywhere else well the name of this article is more of like what is this product that we're actually doing so i'm going to give this and as i said i'm giving this an h1 because i don't have any other headings anywhere on my page normally this would not be an h1 you might see things online about the document outline. I've talked about it previously where you can actually use, like you have a section and then you can have an H1 and then another section and another H1. This was part of the spec. This was put in where you could have multiple H1s on a page and the browser would just sort of figure out how things should work based on you using proper semantic HTML. That is not something that the browsers ever actually implemented. Every time I mention this, people push back on it, but no browser ever implemented that approach to being able to render the document outline that way. So you cannot have multiple H1s per page. So normally you'd probably have an H1 somewhere that's your main thing and then have, you know, these might be H2s or H3s. If you'd like more details on how the heading levels actually work and how they impact the structure of the page, because that is a big part of the actual structure of the page, uh, I'll link to a video in the description below and I'll mention it again at the end so you don't forget about it that talks a lot more about how we want to treat heading or not treat but use our heading levels and because I don't want to use my heading level as um, I, I don't want this style to be linked to it being an h1 I really want it to be h1 h2 h3 shouldn't be used for styling purposes so we will give this the class of product title uh, whoops double underscore title just to follow the same naming that we've used so far uh, and then I have the perfume up here and we do well, what do we do with that? I'm just going to give that um, I'm just going to wrap that as a regular Paragraph right at the top there. So perfume and then the title here is really this one um, If you wanted to just a really quick note We could do something where it's all in my h1 and we use a span and maybe do like perfume and then create like a line break and other stuff um, with like a display block on the span so you know have it all together but I, I really think in this case um we're fine just doing something like that so we have our perfume the title of it is this this is another just regular paragraph i'm going to add some classes in a few spots here um and throw that in there now i'm just i'm doing this the just dragging and dropping um after making stuff so another way that we can wrap things a little bit faster if you want is to select something do a command shift p and then write emmet um, and you'll see here a whole bunch of Emmet things are popping up, but the first one is always gonna be your wrap with abbreviation. So I just push return. It's gonna ask me what I wanna put. I push P and then I push return again. Now that's all good and handy, but what if you want a class on there? Well, again, let's do it. Control shift P. And if you're, I'm on Windows, so I'm using control shift P. If you're on a Mac, it would be probably command shift P. Uh, I'll write Emmet, it's wrap with abbreviation. And now I want a paragraph and we're gonna give this one a class so we can just do a dot. And let's call this one product, product, double underscore, original price. And hit return, and you can see that that gives me, let's just make this a little bit bigger for the time being. Um, we can see that that gives me the product original price on there. And so that could be a faster way to wrap stuff. And on this one, I'm just going to put uh, price, product price, and then the original price. So we have the actual price and the original price here. We're gonna dive into this section a little bit more but before we get into like the do some accessibility stuff in there to make sure that it's being read out properly but in the meantime uh, the other thing I want to do is I know these have to go next to one another so because I know they have to go next to each other I'm going to use a div and wrap them like that I'm not using a section or anything like that I guess you could do like a section class of price or something like that uh, but I'm just going to give this a class of flex group and we'll make that after none of these I haven't we have an empty CSS file so we don't have anything to base anything off of here but um, whenever I get this where I have like I want to group stuff <laughs> um, I tend to use a flex a class of a flex group on here uh, and last but not least we have our button all the way at the bottom so for this let's just do a button with a class of button uh, on there because I think that's a pretty good name um, we do need to get the icon in there so when we get to that stage, we'll explore different approaches that we could use for adding the icon because it is an SVG that was given to us. Uh, if we check our images, we have the icon cart right there that we'll be able to use. Um, but there we go. All the HTML or most of the HTML is done. We will be jumping back over here. Oh, actually, one thing we should add a class up here. Um, class is equal to um, let's just do product 
underscore category. And so uh, I'm doing that because this one is clearly styled differently from this one. This, I haven't given it a class because I just see it as a regular paragraph. I'm assuming that if this was in a bigger ecosystem or whatever, a bigger site, that's what a regular paragraph would look like. So I don't think I need a class for it. Um, and just really quickly there, that's one thing I feel that people make a mistake with when they're using BEM is going a little overboard sometimes. Like here, I'm just calling this a button. I'm not calling it like my product, my product button because again, this button would probably look the same if it was somewhere else. This is its own component. It happens to be inside my product card thing here, but that doesn't mean that it's unique to that. Um, so I'm just calling it a regular button. Same here, this is a regular flex group because I could have other flex groups in other places. When you're using BEM, there are things that might be unique to it. So this title might be unique to this product thing. And maybe not, maybe you have a lot of other titles that look exactly the same. And then you could just have a title within your product and it doesn't have to be something. But if it's something that's unique to that element, then it becomes an element. So you have your block, your element, your modifier. So, uh, and in here I have a regular paragraph, so I don't need a class on it to select it necessarily. Now let's just come up here and add our image really fast. So in this case, let's just go see where it is. It's in a folder called images. So let's do that images. And for now, uh, I am going to choose the mobile version of it as the, the default one. Uh, and of course we do want some alt text on here. So I'll add some quickly. There we go. And so we're ready to start working on our CSS uh, on this now. So what we're going to do is let's shrink this back down. Let's move this a little bit out of the way. You can see all of our stuff has come in and we want to jump on over to here and do stuff with it. And the first thing that I usually recommend we do when we're writing CSS is to start with a CSS reset of some sort. Uh, one of the reasons for that is when the browser gets smaller, you'll notice websites are responsive normally. They're, they don't cause issues, the text reflows, everything is fine, except images. Images don't, um, and there's a few other things that don't. So a, a, re, a nice reset can take care of that. Um, and there's a few other things as well that it can handle. Um, so what we're going to do, oh, and just really fast, <laughs> how I did that in Firefox, it's control shift M and I'm in Firefox right now. So uh, control shift M opens responsive mode. The reason I like Firefox is because I don't have to open my dev tools to open responsive mode. If you're in Chrome, first you wanna open your dev tools and then in the dev tools, you can use the control shift M or you can push this little icon right here. Now moving on to that reset we were talking about, I'll close down that and we're gonna bring in this that I have off screen, which is Josh Como's reset. And I've used Andy Bell's quite a few times in the past and I figured, why don't we take a look at Josh's this time? And if you don't know Josh Como, he has tons of amazing resources on CSS, uh, as well as other topics as well, JavaScript, React. Um, and, and it's just a really good quality blog. And so I'll link to this down below because he actually goes into a lot of detail about each one of the steps and each piece that he's doing here. There's little quizzes and everything too. Uh, it's really good, really high quality content. And for me now, I'm just gonna paste that in and we'll get this out of the way. Uh, and the big thing that has happened is we've taken the margins off of everything, which you can see right here. So we no longer have that space around the outside of our page. And we also have responsive images now. We don't have that overflow that's happening thanks to right here, my image, my picture, both getting a display block and a max width 100%. Also on the video canvas and SVG tends to be a nice little practice here. So this is usually a good thing to have. Some of the other things that are in here, we have the box sizing reset, which is pretty much everywhere. The margin of zero, which is slightly opinionated. Some people don't like doing that on everything, but it works for me. Um, the HTML and the body having a height 100%, just so it makes it a little bit easier for percent based heights on things. Uh, this is a big one, setting the font to inherit for all input buttons, text areas, and selects, which normally don't for some strange reason. Uh, preventing text overflows and what that's doing actually let's look at it we're gonna have to exaggerate or let's just do let's do we'll do this h1 font size of 5 rem so if ever you have a large font size this is generally where you see it happen where when you get to smaller screen sizes if we didn't have this on what's going to happen is it's going to cause some um, horizontal scrolling because the word overflows out the side <laughs> So if you put that on, it breaks the word instead. And as you can see though, it can cause these weird things where you just have like a letter E there because it's just preventing the word from overflowing. It's not doing like a smart break. 
So a bit opinionated on that one. Sometimes it gets weird results. So you just might want to keep your eye out for if something weird is happening, but at least you know what's causing it because you know what's in your reset. So uh, you can do that. And then here, this is for if you're like injecting your site, you know, the HTML via JavaScript, um, whether it's through React or other ways, we're not going to be doing that. We don't really need it. So we'll hit save there and yeah, we're good to go. And the first thing we're going to do now is set up our custom properties. So to do that, I'm going to come all the way up to the top and we're going to create a, or select our root selector, create our root selector here. If you're not familiar with custom properties, it should be very easy to follow along anyway. They're pretty simple or especially how I'm going to be using them in this project. But I'm also going to link to an in-depth playlist um, in the description of this video if you want more information on them. Now the next thing, or for this part, I'm going to make this bigger because um, we don't really need the image right now. What we actually want is the style guide. So we're going to do an open to the side so we can have our style guide open and we can have our CSS open at the same time so we can reference them back and forth. For the layout and what sizes, we're, we'll reference that a little bit but it doesn't really matter. What we want really now is our colors and some of the typography stuff. And I've already set up um, mine right here, but I'll explain what I did, but it's just boring watching me write these out. <laughs> um, so here where we have the primary colors, they have their dark cyan, which really is like this, for me, it's more of a green color. So I call that my primary color and I'll explain the numbering in just a second, but that's my primary color there. And the secondary color is the cream color that's in the background there. So uh, they called them both primary, but they're very different. So I want one to be primary and one to be secondary, just so the colors have different names. Now, as far as the numbers go, 400 for me is like my base color. So it's like a font weight. Font weight 400 tends to be the default. Bolder fonts go 6, 7, 8, 9. And then lighter fonts or thinner fonts go like 3, 2, 1. So I sort of follow the same thing. 400 is my base. So here's secondary. I did 200 because it's super light. You could get a little bit lighter, so I left room for a 100 if ever. Uh, and then the neutral colors here are these ones. And again, I don't really like their naming. I just go with my own neutral for all of them. 900 for the darkest, 100 for the lightest, which is pure white. So you, we know we can't get lighter than that. Uh, and then 400 for like the middle ground. And because this is an HSL, this is at 48% lightness. So to me, that's pretty close to the middle. So I feel pretty safe putting that as a 400. The 900 is always sort of my black color. Uh, and the reason they space these out like that is maybe I you know, realize I missed something along the way. Something was forgotten in the style guide or I wanna add a little touch and I need to squeeze another number in there. It makes it really easy to do. Uh, and if I did need a darker one, I could always go to a thousand. So not a big deal. Now, the next thing we want to get is our typography. Um, for the font size, they didn't give us a lot of information. They just told us that this is at size 14, which is a little bit small, but that's all they really told us. They didn't tell us the font sizes for these other things. And in this case, I'm not going to download the Figma file. We're just going to base it off the JPEG. So we're just going to have to figure out the other font sizes as we go a little bit. We seem to really only have this font size, this font size, and maybe the button one is a little bit different. So I'm not going to bother with custom properties on this. If it was a larger project, I would. But for now, um, I think we're OK. But what I do want to set up is the font weights, because you can see here we have a 500 and 700. Apparently, they're not using the 400. So what I'm going to do is font weight regular is going to be my 500 and a font weight bold is going to be a 700 and what's nice about doing it this way is sometimes your bold might actually be a 900 and sometimes it might be the 600 so you're not locking in so much to the number um right you have your regular bold semi bold all of that and you can sort of set them up as you need to now we also have the font families that we need to set up and we have two different ones so actually let's go and open these um from google and you can control click just to open them directly uh, from VS Code. So we're opening up Montserrat and Francis? Fran Francis? I don't know how to pronounce that one. Um, so we have the two of them. I've already added everything here to Google Fonts, but to add the ones you want, you just scroll down and select the weights that you want, and it will add them in for you. And then I'm going to go and just select all of this, which needs to go in my HTML. So if I jump over to here, I like putting it right before my own. And if you want, you can leave a comment, Google fonts and then here we could say uh, my CSS or custom CSS or whatever you want and so we get uh, three links usually to get uh, with the Google fonts these days and that sometimes changes a little bit just paste in whatever they give you uh, and then we have the two font family rules as well so we'll copy both of those and then go back to my CSS and 
what we want is this one is my font family and I'm gonna call it accent because it's sort of like a fancy font <laughs> Uh, and then this one's gonna be my font family base and you can do like regular or whatever you want to call it um, body and So there you go. We end up with the two font families that are set up. We have my font weights that are set up uh, We're not bothering with the font sizes because we don't really know what they're going to be. So I Think that's all we need for our custom properties for now. So let's hit save on that then we can close our style guide and move this on over and what I think we're gonna do, let's leave this right here, and then we can shrink this guy down. And we saw in the style guide that the small one was at 375, so we'll set the width of our page to the same thing in this responsive mode here and see what we can do with it. So I'm gonna come down after my reset, and let's come here and just do general styling, and we're gonna start with my body. And always start with your generic styling as much as possible. Uh, because I know some people with CSS don't like that it has this like global impact on stuff But that's actually one of the good things about uh, CSS So we can set up my font family and because we have custom properties here We could do the whole var and then start writing it out um, And choose it that way, but in VS code one of the nice things with it is let's do our font weight next font weight and I just have to do double hyphen and then FW because I know that's what I chose for my font weight prefix. And then I can choose from the two that are there. I want regular and it does everything for me. So that's super nice. Hit save. And there we go. Um, it does look a little bit bolder than what they have here, but they said it's 500. So we'll stick with that 500 on there. I will take the color in here because we're seeing the color being used here and here and here for that lighter color. So I tend to try and choose a color right away. So that'd be my color neutral. 400 so we can set that it does look a little bit we'll come back I think um, and see but we'll, we'll try and follow the design as closely as possible um, I'm just worried a little bit about the contrast ratio there uh, we also have the font size font size and in this case they said it's 14 pixels um, in general you can use pixels for a lot of different things in CSS but for font sizes I really recommend either M or rem and usually for font sizes I like 99% of the time I'm going to be using rem uh, if you want to know why I've covered it in previous videos, once again, I'll link to a video on that in the description so we don't deep dive it now, but it's the one place definitely don't use pixels for your font sizes. And actually, now that we made that smaller, the font weight actually does seem to, to be a little bit more similar than what we had there. Now we have the background color as well on all of this. We have my color. Let's do my background color. And that was my uh, color and then primary uh, secondary 200. So we get that coming in. We'll bring the white color just on the card afterward. Um, now for this, and if we look at like the different sites they gave us, like it's always centered on the page horizontally and vertically. So I think what I'm actually going to do, I didn't know we could do this and see multiple pictures at once. That's kind of interesting. Um, we don't need both right now though. So we'll go back like that. But uh, what I want to do for that, like for this, it would work, but this isn't something I would use on a regular project. So let's just do like for this project only. Um, is often with this I'd have a min height we don't need to have that um, because we have the body already has a height of 100% with the HTML thanks to the reset we used so I'm just gonna do a display of grid and then a place content center which should put it right in the middle nice uh, if ever you try this and it doesn't work often you just need to put a min height of 100 bh uh, and that will also solve it because you're giving your body a height that fills up the viewport and just to <laughs> Uh, bring the spacing that we have here on there. I am going to come in with a margin of one rem um, or it could be padding of one rem but just to add that space which we actually removed earlier uh, funnily enough but there we go we were bringing that in just to give us that spacing that we have here. Uh, I'm not going to worry too much about the top and the bottom because you know if I were to shrink this down it would get closer or farther because we've centered it on the page. So we'll put this back to 375 and now we can work on the card itself, which are in this case, we called it dot product. Um, so here we can do product, product styles. Before we get to the product styles, let's come here. This is my general styles. I'm gonna do another one here. It's like utility, utilities, which is going to be my flex group that we created. So we'll do that one just so we can get these two prices next to each other. So display flex, Right away, they go next to each other. We can add a gap there. It's probably a one rem based on what I see here. Uh, and then we're also going to come in with a um, flex, flex wrap, flex 
wrap of wrap. Now, I don't think in this project this is actually going to come in and impact anything. So we're never going to get so narrow that it needs to wrap. But whenever I have a flex group like this, I like having it on there just to prevent overflow and allowing wrap um, things to wrap around if they need to. We might also need to come in with an alignment here on this just to make sure that it stays vertically aligned, but we'll worry about that once we set our font size. We're actually going to need a little bit more with this um, and have a visually hitting class and stuff, but I'm not going to stress about that yet. We'll sort of circle back around to that. We could do my button, but let's come back to there. Let's just style the product now. Um, so on the product, let's start with the, we'll start with the low hanging fruit, which would be my background color of my uh, neutral 100, which is just my pure white. And then the border radius, which is pretty obvious. I'm going to make it too big so we can actually see what happens here. Uh, so with the border radius of two, you can see here that it's like a really aggressive border radius, but we don't have it on any of the other corners. And the white background actually is, but the image and the button are overflowing outside of that radius that's on there. So to prevent that, the easiest thing is just to throw an overflow of hidden on here which technically could have repercussions depending on what you're up to, but in this situation, there's no issue. And I think this border radius is around 0.5 rem. And I will say that a lot of people like that trick of like resetting rem to a base 10 instead of a base 16, but most things in web design these days are based on a base 16. So border radiuses are often like four, eight, uh, 12, 16, and then upwards. Spacing is often following the same thing. So for font sizes, sometimes it's a little bit annoying trying to figure out what a font size actually is. But for almost every other measurement you ever do, having the rem as a base 16 actually makes life a lot easier. So yeah, I just tend to these days not bother with that trick. I often get asked why I don't do it. Um, I've just got used to base 16 and it works really well for most web stuff. Now, if you remember, we actually have two different pieces for the intersection of our product here. Uh, we have the picture itself, and then we have this product content here. So the picture is obviously the picture at the top. Uh, and then the content is this thing down here at the bottom with all of the actual content in there. And so we'll come into the content, but we're sort of going to add some stuff to the product itself to make this work and be a little bit easier to manage. So I'm going to do the product uh, content. And what I mean by that is like here we have the spacing that's all the way around on that. And so my product content could definitely just have like padding one rem and then we get the spacing that's coming along and it looks a little bit bigger here. It might even be a 1.5. Uh, and that's perfect and it works really well, except what I personally like doing for stuff like this is coming up here and letting my product control a lot of the other stuff or my product class actually control a lot. So here if we did like product or con we'll call it content content padding and 1.5 rem. So this is a locally scoped custom property. It's not in my root. It's not globally available. It's only available to things that are inside this product class or actually like inside of this article that's right here. So by doing that, then here I can do a var of content padding. Uh, and the reason I like doing that is then later on, if I'm coming to make changes and I need to change my padding, I'm not digging through all the individual pieces that are going to be in here. I can control a lot of the layout and the main parts of that just by looking at this one product class and then say there is little nitty gritty things you do want to dive in. But when a lot of like the general stuff is here and you don't have to figure out where something is coming from, I find that just makes maintainability a little bit easier. Now within this content area, and let's just put on here, I'm going to remove this after, but we're going to put a border of three pixels solid red so we can really see where we're working. So we're working in this. We have the padding that we put on there. And one of the issues is we, in our reset that we got from Josh, there was the margin of zero, which took all of our spacing away. And I want to bring spacing back because we can see that there is spacing between all the elements here. And there's different ways of doing this. But when I see my button is actually stretching across the entire bottom, Right away, for me, my mind goes to grid or flex. And because the content is stacked this way, uh, there's nothing fancy that has to go on. I don't need columns anywhere. We've already set up our columns for this. For me, the easiest thing to do is to say, this red box is a display of grid. So right here, let's set that up, grid, uh, <laughs> grid. display grid, which actually causes almost nothing to happen, except now our button's already stretching the full width across. I didn't have to do anything, which is super nice. Uh, and then because it is a grid uh, container, I can add in a gap and we can say that the gap is going to be a one rem or something like that. And it adds in the spacing we need that way. So that's, I, I love that. 
Uh, but once again, because we have the card content here, we could also say that we have the uh, content spacing as well and set that there and then use this guy down here. So var content spacing. And that way I don't have to worry about this. This is my product here is controlling a lot. I need to change my padding. I change it here, right? I need to change my spacing. I change it here. And this is controlling everything that's inside of it for layout purposes. I really like that. Uh, I wouldn't abstract too much and like get really nitty gritty with it, but for stuff like this, just the way I tend to like to work these days. And with that, now we actually do have to get into the nitty gritty a little bit though. Uh, so let's just sort of work our way down. So we had the product category first, cate category, which in this case, the font size, let's do, uh, we'll start with the text transform of upper case. And one thing I've noticed is people sometimes when they're newer to HTML or CSS specifically, is they declare things that they don't actually need to declare. Uh, and they sort of go overboard with stuff. And so here, like, I don't need a font size on here if I think the font size is the right size. So I'm gonna leave it as is uh, for now. And if I have to adjust it, I will. And I'm not adding spacing to it if I don't have to. So it's always like, only add something when you feel like you need it. So here I need a text transform and I need some letter spacing. So we'll do those two. It looks like a lot, uh, three, well, it's gonna be like five or six maybe. That looks pretty good. I'm pretty happy with that. Maybe the font size is slightly smaller, but I think we're, well, let's set this one up next. Um, and then we'll see, cause sometimes making this bigger, the other ones can feel a little bit smaller sometimes. I don't know if that would be a, a six or a five. Letter spacing, remember I said you can use pixels for stuff. Letter spacing is one where I tend to use it. Uh, it could be safer to use M in all honesty. So it's related to the font size. So if you change the font size, the spacing changes with it. Um, but in general, I've, I, you end up with really small numbers and the pixel, I don't know, it ends up working out fine. So up next, I believe it was the product title that we wanted. Uh, and in this case, the font size, I don't know what it's gonna be. Let's just throw a two rem on there. Font family, uh, we know is just my variable that we set up, so FF, and it was my accent. Uh, the color is obviously dark, so that would be my color and then 900. And you can sort of cheat a little. Do color 900 and it only shows you, if I had multiple ones, it would show me all my 900s and I could just choose the one I want. Or you can just even do a color N900 like that. Um, so you, VS Code is pretty smart at being able to choose which custom property you want. So you can save a lot of keystrokes along the way if you sort of know what you're looking for. Um, here the line height is way too big. We could change that for the product title, but in general, any font sizes that start hitting like a 1.5 or especially a two or bigger than that, you're going to want a smaller line height on there. So what we could do actually, let's come here and just add this in ourselves. We're gonna do an H1, H2, H3, and give them all a line height of 1.1. We don't actually need the H2 and H3 in this project right now. Um, but it could be a safer thing. You could also just link it. There's other ways of setting that up, but we're gonna do it that way um, and assume those are always our larger font sizes. Um, and in this case, it actually looks tighter <laughs> than that. So maybe it's even a one, which makes me maybe wanna do that more directly related to the product title, but there we go. I think that looks pretty close to what we want. And I think we actually got the font size right too. So that's a nice, a nice little thing. Uh, I am wondering now if this font size is a little bit too big. So let's do a font size of like 8.25 rem, 8.25, 0.825 rem, which, yeah, that looks maybe better. 125, we'll stick with that, I guess. Uh, sure, <laughs> I think that looks a little bit closer to what we have here. I'm just sort of examining the two of them. So we'll leave that like that, um, which is getting very small in our font sizes, but it is what it is. Uh, I'm also looking here, the font, the since I was looking at the line heights, the line height in the design looks bigger than the line height here. So we did have a line height change in our default here. Um, so I'm actually gonna boost this one up and that looks better. So we're gonna go with the 1.7 as our default and the one for the ones right there. Uh, so this is now looking good. Now we have this one uh, that we wanna change. And one thing I will say, like I got my font sizes right. So the line breaks are happening at the right spaces and I guess my spacing is correct. But with the web, because of the way it works, as soon as like the sizing of things change a little bit and even font rendering can be a little bit different, if your line breaks aren't at the exact same place between the two, don't overstress it and don't overthink it too much. <laughs> um, you know, if of was coming down here, I really wouldn't care. 
So don't over like don't try and match always and waste your time on little 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 things like that when there's the bigger fish to fry and at the very end if you really want to try and play around with it you can but sometimes it's a combination of your font size and your padding and like all these little things and that you change one and then it you have to change the other one and change it, it, you go a little bit crazy but in this case it's working out and my line breaks happen to be in the same place which is always nice when that does work out so next is the price and the price there is a bit of stuff we're going to do and we're going to jump back in our html for this one a little bit too but let's do my product price um so i'm only the product price was this one and this is my previous price so i'm not going to worry too much about that but let's set my font size it looks the same as before so a two we'll see what happens here uh the font family and this is where we're repeating ourselves a little bit because we're setting the same font size and the same font family. So it is possible that instead of repeating ourselves, it would be better to set a um, utility class that could actually do some of this stuff for us. I'm not gonna get into it for this project because it is a pretty small one, but anytime you see yourself doing the same thing in different places and then just changing the color, maybe you could do it with a class that does the font size, a class that does the font family, and a class that does the color. Um, just to throw that out there and we can set our color. I think that's right bang on. Um, as I did say, I thought we'd have to set something for the vertical alignment there. I don't always set this up in my flex group, but it depends on the, if I saw more stuff for this design, maybe this would have to be broken out or maybe it would just be a consistent thing in all my flex groups, but we'll just throw it here for simplicity for now. So an align items of center to vertically center that. Now what we want to do is cross this out and there's a few things with crossing it out that we have to take into account when we're doing this but the easy part of it is I'm going to select it all control shift P for my wrap choose Emmet and then I'm going to put an S tag uh, and the S is strike through so if I do that you can see it's crossed out and you might feel like ah I'm done uh, the only thing is we're not <laughs> the issue with having this um, is when it comes to a screen reader or assistive technology that would be going through this page. And if you're going, oh, I want to use semantic tags. So I'm trying to use my article and my picture and I'm using proper headings and stuff like that. I'm using buttons where buttons should be used, links where links should be used. Uh, we do have to take into account how people consume sites and not everybody is a sighted user and people are using, um, they might have visual impairments or be blind and still can will go on websites. Uh, and there's software that will read the page to them and if they got to this part it would literally say <laughs> 149.99 it wouldn't there's no extra context there when we're visually we can see what's going on so let's turn word wrap on here just so we can see things a little bit easier and maybe push this over um, to make it a little bit easier to see because we're going to write some html here and and so for this original price the, the, again the strike through is not actually won't come through on a screen reader so what I'm actually going to do is out here, I'm going to add a span. We'll, we'll add something to the span in a second. Well, let's break this on to its own line just so we can sort of see what we're doing here. And there we go. Uh, and in the span, what I'm going to do is original price here. And on this one too, we're actually going to do something right here. As I'm going to take this and we're going to drop that right here. And we're going to put uh, current price. And the reason I'm doing this is to add a little bit of context. So now if we actually look at the page, it's gonna say current price 149.99, original price 169.99. Now the design doesn't have that here in writing because if we're looking at it, it's obvious what's happening. But if we want to be able to convey this to just through writing without any visual reference, having current price 149.99 and original price 169.99 helps us understand what's actually going on here. But obviously we don't want this text or this text to actually show up. So to be able to do that, I have this off screen and I'm gonna just copy and paste it in. And I'm gonna put a link to uh, where what I'm using this from, but I'll put it in my utilities here. And I call it visually hidden. You're also gonna see this as an SR only. So SR only is for screen reader only. I think visually hidden, we're, we're hiding it visually. Uh, and as I said, I'll put a link to more uh, details on this on a blog post from Scott O'Hara, which is really good. Uh, that explains and basically it's just doing a whole bunch of stuff to make sure that we don't see it on the page but that it's still accessible by a screen reader so by having that there it is part of my markup it's part of the dom it's part of the actual content but we can do a class equals visually hidden and i should have done that on both at once but we can copy and paste it 
copy that, paste it there. And now if we move this on over and we take a look, it looks exactly like it did before. So now we're adding extra context here, but we're hiding it visually because visually we, we had that showing in a different way. Uh, it's not hard to do. And it, do we need the current price? Maybe not just having original price might be enough, but I'll, I'll leave it with both. Um, there we go. We have that coming up like that. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is our button down here at the bottom. And that's a fun one because of the little icon here, but let's just start by styling the button itself. And I'm actually going to do that. We have my body. It's not really a utility class, um, but I'm going to, we'll do our button here, button. And again, this button, I'm not putting it as like a product button because we probably have buttons that look the same that are used in other places other than maybe the little shopping cart that are on there. Um, and we just had the button class on here. So we'll start with that. And one thing we're going to do is the pointer of cursor, or I always get that wrong, cursor of pointer, which just gives me the little hand icon. Some people think on buttons we shouldn't do this. Um, I've seen debate both ways. I'm one that actually does like having that on there for the extra visual reference, even though we will also be adding a hover. They give us a, like a hover thing here, so we will bring that in after or shortly um, as we work on this. Let's also come in with some padding on this. Uh, we don't really know what the padding left and right we need are, but in general, I'm going to say it's a 0.5 on the top. I usually go with like a 3 to 1 as a default if I don't know. So 0.5 on the top and bottom and a 1.5 on the left and the right should be okay. Um, let's also border 0 gets rid of the border that's on there. We actually, because I'm doing the cursor pointer, um, even though this is an actual button that I put it on, I'm gonna do a text decoration of none, just to say that sometimes things like this get added to links, rather, you know, we get a link that looks like a button. So just to cover that base, if ever it happens. Because I know that I'm gonna be bringing the shopping cart icon in, I am going to do a display of inline flex. So inline flex is just, it's still an inline item, but it's on the inside, it's flex based. So um, it allows, it works well. Now you'll see that's moved the text over from being centered, which is fine. Uh, so we're gonna add a justify content of center on there to center it that way. Uh, I also know we want it to eventually be centered vertically as well. So we'll add an align items of center on here too. Uh, and we're going to want a space. I don't know what that space is going to be, but for now let's do a gap of 0.5 rem because it looks pretty small between the two of them. We can always update that a little bit later. And just because of how I like to work, I always have my gap with my flex. Um, so yeah, there we go. Uh, we need the colors that are going to be on this. And I think my padding actually is a little bit bigger on the top and the bottom. So let's stick with that for now. Um, we can do a background color and it's my primary there we go and the color itself which is going to be my neutral 100 and the font weight in this case actually looks a bit bigger too so font weight is my font weight bold that looks better it doesn't even look bold enough really but there we go i'm wondering if the font size here is a little bit bigger too font size of one rem font size looks a little bit bigger 0.925 we'll go with that and see how that goes, but it looks a little bit closer to what we have here. The joy of trying to eyeball something off of a JPEG. Um, and I think the only other thing we need is our border radius. So I'm going to bring that up where I have my padding, our border, and then uh, we can do my border radius. Uh, in this case, I guess it's similar to our card itself. So we'll set that as a 0.5 and I think that looks pretty good. Uh, we'll start with our hover and our focus state. So let's come and do my button. Uh, and actually what I'm going to do is an is hover focus uh, just because it's easier than writing button hover and button focus. It's a little bit faster. If you don't know about the is, um, it's just a way that we can group things with it. Um, I'll link once again to a video down below that talks about what is. Uh, and we, there's also the where. So you might have seen one or the other. They're both the same. Where has zero specificity is comes with specificity. I wouldn't mind keeping the specificity of this. Um, and it chooses the highest specificity selector out of whatever is in the grouping here. Uh, so in this case, what happens? They make it darker. We didn't have a darker color. We're gonna have to add a color. So one nice thing with using HSL is if you do have a darker color uh, is let's duplicate this color here. We're gonna call it 500. And because I know it's darker, this is my hue. So that's the color. This is the saturation. So how saturated or desaturated the color is. 
And this is my lightness. So if I need it to be darker, I can just come in and make that a darker color. And you can see it's a bit darker. Maybe we bring it to like a 20. And now I have the color I want. So I can come down, find the button I'm working on. And we can say here that the background color is my, uh, that was 500, right? Primary 500. So now we should get a thing. Oh, it's not working right now because I'm in um, responsive mode and in Firefox and in Chrome, the default is for touch. So uh, because I'm in Firefox, I can click this to disable it. In Chrome, I think it's in the menu. Um, there's like a little drop down menu, but we can disable that and get it. If you can't figure out where it is, just turn off responsive mode um, and you'll see if it's working or you can keep it on and just use tab and it should highlight when you tab over it. And so I can see it's working. So I'm pretty happy with that. Now we need to add in that shopping cart icon. So to add in the shopping cart icon, I could come in here and I could add it in myself, right? So we could have button and then I could put like the SVG directly in the button. I'm going to assume that if we have the shopping cart icon there, that we'd have this range of buttons that would have different icons. So you might have a shopping cart one, you might have one that has, I don't know, offsite or no, that doesn't make sense, but I don't know. You'd have different icons coming in your buttons. And so because of that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a data attribute here. And so we're going to do data icon. I guess that makes sense. I'm going to do shopping, uh, shopping or shopping cart. Shopping cart is fine, I think. So this, uh, well, so we'll see why I'm doing this in a second. So we have add to cart, shopping cart right there. We'll hit save. And now I want to actually bring that in. So I have my button and we can, with CSS, you can hook into that. So we can say that we have my button and we can say data icon is equal to shopping cart. And you could do this with a modifier class instead of a data attribute, but um, I've really f fallen in love with doing a lot of things of hooking in via um, data attributes instead. It also opens it up to a little bit even easier JS hook and stuff for when you do need to bring in some JavaScript. Um, and it, it makes it a little bit obvious, like here I'm doing my icon and I'm saying what icon I want. And then you could have a, a like a data, you know, this is my primary button maybe, and you have a, a secondary button. So you have like data, uh, like data type. So it's your, your button type. And then you have the different types of buttons you're bringing in. So um, I think it just makes, like it adds a little extra context in a way of what's going on. Now I'm not actually going to do anything on this. What I actually want to do is do this on the before. So we're going to bring in the pseudo element for this. And if you know anything about pseudo elements, you know, you need a content. And the content, like if I put the letter A here, you can see the A is actually showing up. Uh, I'm gonna leave my content blank. If you do not include the content, a blank content, then your pseudo element won't be on the page. So we need to have that there for it to render. Uh, we wanna, let's go check out that SVG they gave us. So it's in my images, the icon cart. And uh, if we come and take a look, I have an extension in VS Code that lets me see what they look like, except it doesn't seem to be working, so I can't see it. Uh, but I can see here the width and the height of this in the SVG. So width is 15, the height is 16. So I'm gonna bring that in right here. We're actually gonna say width is 15 pixels and the height is 16 pixels. So we're matching the height from the SVG, uh, assuming that's the size that we actually want it to be. You do wanna be careful with width, like set widths and heights, but for icons, you sort of, they won't be really responsive usually. So having a fixed thing, it won't cause overflow at 16 pixels. So I'm okay with that. So now if we go and take a look, uh, you can actually see add to cart is a little bit offset. And let's just give this a background, background of red. And there's where my icon is going to go. Often with pseudo elements, uh, if you're using them, I have content width and height. Often you also need to either have a positioning on them or have a display. So is it display block or inline block or whatever? Because it's a flex item, the, it, it's going to render because it's a flex item. And so I don't need to declare the display type or anything like that for it to be on the page. Uh, but what we obviously want to do is add in the icon here. And so what we're going to do is set a background image. And there's different ways you could set the background image. One of them is you could just actually bring in the URL here, URL, and we could do, it was uh, images and then shopping. And I think that would work, except we have the background red here overwriting it. So let's just see. So we could just do it like that and it would work fine. Now there is another way we could actually do uh, a background image here with an SVG, which is with URL encoding. There's sites that will give you what to put there. The nice thing is it doesn't have to like get the SVG asset from wherever else. Um, it just has it encoded here, but we'll keep it simple for this tutorial because I don't want to overdo things. 
Um, but yeah, there we go. I think that's that's looking pretty good. I think even our spacing on that is basically what we wanted to have with that gap uh, that we'd set here. Maybe we could do that as a 7.5 instead, just to space it out a little bit extra. Yeah, that looks a little bit better. So we'll go with that. And I think at this size, everything is done. So now what happens when we get to a larger size, we have to decide, and this is the fun thing when you have like a small size and a big size, is you have to decide when is it gonna switch over to be two columns. And so let's take it and start looking at where we want that to actually happen. And it could be around here, but I'm just thinking like if we made it two columns now, they'd be very narrow columns. So maybe we get that to kick in like around here-ish. So I'm just looking up here, it's 599, so around 600 maybe. So let's see what happens if we do that around 600. So we'll move this back over um, and we'll leave that. I'll leave the design off for a second and let's just go and find my product. And we wanna make it two columns. So we're gonna use a media query at this point to do it. And I think what we're going to do is on my product, I'm going to do a display of grid and nothing will really change. And you're often thinking if we need two columns, you'd want a display of flex. Uh, but for this case, I'm gonna use a display grid because I tend to default to grid these days for a lot of things. And so then we can say an at media min width of, we said 600 pixels. So we can say 600 pixels there and say that this is going to have the product um, grid template columns. And we can just do one FR, one FR. And that means we're at 581 now. So when we cross over, we get two columns. And I think that looks pretty good actually for like how, like if this was at 500 instead, I just think that like, you know, this is kind of squished there. It's getting really tall here. So I think the 600 is a little bit better of a zone um, for that to actually happen at. So I'm, I'm gonna stick with the 600 and we have a few things that are definitely going to need fixing up. Um, one of them is we can see it gets really wide and the card definitely doesn't get that wide. And we have the issue with the wrong image being here. And so we'll start with the image because that I think is the more interesting part of it. And that's why I went with the picture here is the picture element is a great one for allowing art direction and having actual images in rather than using background images because I could use, set this up as a background image on like an empty div here um, and just make it work with a little bit of CSS but having images it allows us to have alt text on them which we can't have and usually if there's a picture I like having it as content a lot of the time unless it's just really a decoration background image type thing but in this case an actual image makes sense and to be able to change the image, we wanna bring in a source uh, tag right here. And on source, instead of just doing an SRC, we're gonna do an SRC set. So it's a source set. And you could actually provide multiple one, like multiple different images here, uh, depending on different stuff like resolution and other stuff. I'm not gonna deep dive the stuff you can do with source set, um, but we're gonna just come in with a source here. So the source for it is my images. And then we have the desktop version that we're gonna bring in. And if I do that, you can see it's switched here, but it's also going to be switched here because we haven't given it any context and it doesn't know which one to use when. So it's just assuming that it's gonna use this source. And we're gonna see how this is working in a bit more detail. But what we also wanna do now is do a media attribute. And this works just like a media query where inside I can do min width inside of parentheses, min width 600 pixels, because that's where we were setting our breakpoint and I hit save and now we have the large image here and it switches over to the shorter image here. You can see the leaves are a bit different. The top of the bottle is cut off. And when I switch, we get the large image that's filling up all the space. And there we go. Isn't that pretty magical and pretty amazing? I think so. It's pretty cool how that works. Um, and what, what it's really doing is if I do an inspect on here, you can see it says that it's the mobile just because it's reading the DOM. But when I hover on top, it's actually taking this source and replacing the JPEG, like the image tag here, the source on the image is getting replaced with this one when we hit this media thing right here. Uh, as I said, there's a lot more you can do with pictures than just art direction, but they're very good for this art direction thing where you change images based on different screen sizes. If you'd like to know the other things you can do with it, there is a link to a video below because I've covered a lot of stuff. Now, uh, there's problems with this image though, is it's forcing the height of all this to get really big, which is causing our spacing to really get mucked up. Um, and my button's even stretching in height, which is kind of weird. So we do want to fix things up. So let's go look at the design once again, and maybe we'll make it a little bit bigger. And since we're dealing more horizontal, we can squish it this way. 
Uh, so we're staying centered, but you can see everything, the spacing and everything seems to stay more or less the same, and we should limit the maximum width of this to stop it from just getting too wide. So we can do that, but let's start by giving it the max width, because this is where I said sometimes people will go like, oh, look at all this spacing that's being added here, but part of that spacing is getting added because the card's getting wider and wider and wider. So I think what we're going to do is on my product card, let's come in with a max width and I can't, I don't know what it is. Uh, there's tools you can use to like measure in your JPEGs and everything, but let's just come in with a max width of 600 pixels and see what it looks like. And then you adjust from there. Um, and let's compare that to my image that I have here and let's get the zoom to hundred percent so we can actually match them properly. You know what? It's lined up bang on. So <laughs> max width 600 is basically what we're after. So we can see here, we're there, it has switch over and lock right in. Super duper. And right away, just by setting that max width, the max width is preventing it from getting too tall. And because it's not getting taller and taller and taller, because as it was going this way, the image aspect ratio was letting the image grow and was mucking up all the spacing. All of that has sort of gone out the window and we don't run into that problem anymore. So a nice, simple solution right there. Now, one thing I am noticing is while things have lined up really well on the outsides, if we look here, the spacing here, this looks bigger on this one than we have right here. So we already set up our content padding and we had our content spacing. The spacing, I think, is perfectly fine. Uh, you know, if we look at it this way, I think the spacing and everything is okay. The height of the card looks, their card actually looks a little bit taller than mine. So maybe we could adjust it, but I think this might do the trick. Whereas here in the media query, because we have this content padding, and this is why custom properties are great, and we don't need to create more and more selectors. We can just come here and we can adjust the padding on the content within the parent selector. Uh, and I think just setting it up to a two actually works a little bit better. And it gives us that spacing here that we had, and that probably fixes, and I'm really just like random eyeballing it right now. Um, it's not really necessarily the best way to go <laughs> when you're doing this, um, but, um, whoops, let's say we just move that over and you can sort of judge how things are and look at that, the height is bang on too. So I think that was the adjustment that we sort of needed uh, on that front. So I'm really happy with how it's looking now and it's time to put it online. And luckily this is super easy to do. So what I'm gonna do is open up the uh, source control here in VS Code. And the source control, if you wanna to get to it, it's sh control shift G, probably command shift G on a Mac, or you can just go to the view and then you should see a source control right there. And you have the choice to initialize repository or publish it to GitHub. And VS Code is owned by Microsoft, so it's GitHub, so there's a connection there. Uh, for this, you will need to have a GitHub account. So if you don't have one, sign up for one. You're going to need one as a developer anyway. Uh, but let's just do an initialize repository to start with. And here, we're just going to put in uh, initial commit. Now, normally, the initial commit has nothing in it. Um, you're not bringing like the entire project in. but we're doing this here at the end. And then we can just click on publish branch right there. And we can choose, um, it's asking us, do we wanna make it a private GitHub repository or a public one? Uh, if you want, it doesn't matter which one you choose. I'm gonna make mine public, but if you wanna do it private, you can still publish the, like, the site actually online afterward. So just choose which one you wanna do. And now we have published it onto GitHub and there's an open on GitHub that we can click right there and that will open it on GitHub and you can see your project right there. Now, I just realized I made a mistake. And so this would be, I forgot to change the readme template to just readme. So I'm actually gonna fix that now. So let's come back to here and we want to go in here. I'm gonna do my readme template and we're gonna rename this. And this is good if you're not used to GitHub. So readme, just like that, which is the file that uh, GitHub is looking for, for the readme. And then we can go back to the source control and we can put here the message. So re, uh, yeah, we'll just do renamed readme. Just give, say what you did. Um, and the, uh, then we can sort of hit submit that and then sync changes. And when you do sync changes, it's pushing that change up back onto GitHub instead of only having it locally on your computer. So once that is done there, we can refresh our page. And now we actually have the readme that's coming in properly. And obviously we could update that and change stuff and put your name and, you know, the different stuff that you would actually want to put in this readme. I'm not going to worry about it too much at, at, at this time, but we're going to, it's ready to go now. Uh, and why this is important is the next step we're going to do, which is I'm going to use Netlify. You could definitely use GitHub pages for this as well, but I have most of my stuff set up on uh, Netlify. So it's just netlify.com. Let me bring that on the screen. 
Uh, so right there, we have our netlify.com. I already have an account, so we're gonna log in. Uh, and now I wanna do an add new site. Oh, I have a failed build on something I'll have to look at after, but add new site. And I can import an existing project. I can start from a template or deploy manually. So if you wanted to and you didn't have a GitHub account, deploy manually, you just drag your folder in and your, it makes a website based on your folder. But I'm gonna do an import an existing project. And then it's on GitHub, so I'm gonna choose GitHub right here. It's gonna make sure that I'm authorized, so it might ask you to log in, I already am, and my repo name. Uh, and in this case, it was my product, product preview. Uh, it was based on the folder name. It just used my folder name for doing it. So product preview card component main, I can select that. Uh, it's gonna ask us where it is. So it's in my master branch. If you're not sure about the branch name, it is right here. You can see it says master. It might be main for you. So just make sure that it's the correct one there, but you should have a drop down with all the available ones. Uh, if there's more than one and then build settings in this case we don't have any build to actually do so we don't have to worry about any of this stuff i can just hit deploy site we can see that now site deploy is in progress and you can actually click on that and you can watch sort of the click starting up you can see what you know as it's going through everything so it's busy deploying it's starting to build it there's not a lot here, so it should really, it's already done. <laughs> um, so sometimes you might have more complex deploys, or now it's done, the site is live. So I didn't even edit that, you can see how fast it was. And now here is the link and it is live and it's online and anybody can see it. So really easy to get things online. If you make an update, you update your code in the way you normally would, then in your source control, submit that, push it to GitHub. As soon as that push hits, GitHub, Netlify is going to see a change on the master branch and it's going to update the site automatically. You don't have to do anything. It's just that change is going to happen uh, within a couple of minutes. So really, really cool, really easy to do. And I really hope you enjoyed this video. And during this video, I did mention a lot of other videos along the way. So if you're interested in those ones I did mention, they are right here or there are extra links down below as well. And with that, I would like to thank my enablers of awesome, Jan, Johnny, Michael, Patrick, Simon, and Tim, as well as all my other patrons for their monthly support. And of course, until next time, don't forget to make your corner of the internet just a little bit more awesome.